Hello, and uh, welcome to everyone on the webinar. Um, today we're going to be discussing Vectris Cloud Detection and Response for AWS. Uh, just a few housekeeping things to start with. Um, you'll notice, you'll probably notice by now that the webinar has a few widgets. Uh, the most important one, apart from the slides, is the Q&A box, where you can send in any questions that you have. Uh, we'll review the questions at the end of the webinar, and I'll try and get through as many of these as I can. Uh, please notice the resource link containing some hopefully interesting links and also the survey section at the bottom of your screen. And we'd really appreciate it if you could take that survey before you leave today. With all that being said, let's start. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my name is Martin Kinder, uh, and I'm one of the senior consulting analysts at Tra AI. Uh, please ignore, excuse my voice. I'm uh, recovering from the spicy cold and uh, may cough a little bit. I'm a member of Vectra's MDR, or Managed Detection and Response Team. Uh, we assist our customers in the management and analysis of detections to ensure they're getting as much value as possible from the platform. Um, this places us in a unique position <coughs> to gain insights into the type of detections that indicate potentially damaging activities occurring within an environment. Some of these experiences are what I'd like to share with you today. So we'll start off today's webinar by talking about exactly what Vectris Cloud Detection and Response for AWS actually is. There's a number of screenshots here of dashboards and layouts, which I'll move relatively quickly through so we have more time for the actual detection discussion. We'll then talk about which indicators and detections highlight potentially unauthorized access uh, and privilege misuse. And finally, we'll run through some examples of how you can respond at speed to them. Finally, to wrap things up, <coughs> I will answer as many questions as possible. Uh, you've sent through the Q&A. So, I shamelessly stole this image from a presentation one of my colleagues delivered earlier this year, and it, mainly because it resonated with me. Um, Cloud is complex to build, um, making it easy to mess up, right? There's usually three different things that you need to get a resource happening, which is network connectivity, access, and encryption. Um, the environments grow exponentially, uh, and if infrastructure as code is utilized, there's also a risk that the attack service also grows unnecessarily. And finally, due to DevOps, SecOps, Agile, whatever you're running in your environment, you can be assured that the environment is likely to be in a flux of change pretty much all the time. So why are traditional approaches to cloud security failing? Um, cloud posture security management systems are constantly out of date. Uh, cloud native tools bring their own headaches. And I know we won't all agree, but the use of seam in a team developing use cases uh, is always a step behind the attackers. Before we discuss any specific activities that an attacker may perform, we need to talk about what Vector Cloud Detection and Response for AWS is. So here's the statement that's actually taken from the AWS marketplace, and I'll leave you to read through it. But what I wanted to mention is that, you know, Vectra CDR for AWS identifies attackers' methods originating in the cloud or the cloud control plane would be more accurate across services, accounts, and regions, right? Please note there are other Vectra products that can actually do packets. Um, AWS EC2 VMs talking to each other um, 
and these uncover attacker methods in the AWS VPC. CDR for AWS D with EC2, IM, and many other AWS IaaS and PaaS services by ingesting their native logs. So here we have a list of the detections that currently, as of this webinar, Vectra can find based on real attack scenarios. Um, we break detections down into types, command and control, reconnaissance, lateral movement, exfiltration, and informational. Um, I won't go through all of them. I will actually discuss a few of them later on. And to be honest, they're fairly self-explanatory. Um, it's often called out to me as to why the CNC has AWS root credential usage. I don't have a simple answer for it. Um, my feeling is because it doesn't really fit anywhere else within that space and it shouldn't be used uh, on a regular basis regardless. The Tor activity makes sense, suspicious credential makes sense, external network discovery, etc. So each detection itself actually within the platform has its own explanation. Um, we actually extract that to a PDF, which you can download as well. But when you're in the platform, if you do not necessarily understand what the detection is, there's always a little question mark next to the detection and it will pull up these kinds of details. And the details will give you a breakdown of what is actually triggering the detection. So what in this case, we can see an AWS network configuration discovery um, and a principal was observed performing a set of anomaly API requests that can be associated with enumeration of VPC. Cool, makes sense. We then try and provide you with a possible root cause, right? Now, there is always multiple reasons why something will occur and why a detection will occur within any platform. What we provide you with here is kind of the two ends of the spectrum. One is an attacker may be actively enumerating how the network is being in, in the environment are actually configured. But just the same at the opposite end, it can be an IT administrative individual who's trying to figure out how something is particularly configured and therefore is using calls that may have malicious, appear to have malicious intent. We'll give you some business impact, some steps to verify. And if you'll notice on the left there, two things. <coughs> Excuse me. One, the MITRE, which is obvious, will actually give you all the different MITRE breakdowns. Um, and those are actually clickable links. So if you click on it, it's going to send you off to the MITRE website. And you can have a look at those particular things. Um, but that scale there is each detection is given a threat and a certainty you know, and it will guide you towards how bad to your environment it is and with what level of certainty we can actually see this particular detection. So you can see here that we're kind of sitting at a, about a 45-45. So the threat, relatively minimal at the same time, um, our confidence on that is around about the same that it is possibly malicious activity. This is what the dashboard itself kind of looks like. Um, and look, every security professional has their own process for investigations. So I'm going to show you several dashboards where detections can be understood and investigated and worked through. Some people will start from the core. Some people will go directly to a detection if they get a notification through scene, email, notification, something along those lines. So. Firstly, we break down accounts into certain quadrants. So we have our critical, our high, our medium, and our low. The advantage then is that the analyst is immediately able to understand where they should be putting in all their time and their effort. Um, you'll notice I've actually changed this to show the last 90 days. It's a demo environment. There's not that many detections sometimes harder to get some good data. So I had to blow that out. By default, it's on seven days, 30, 60, 90. Um, on the right here is a breakdown of the actual detections that you're seeing. 
Um, previously, I talked about the categories of the different types of detections. Here it's showing those categories. Here it's showing the active uh, detections that are in there. And then over here, uh, the worst offenders from an account scenario, right? Moving on to the next one. By choosing a specific account to investigate, we can drill into the timeline, which you can see along the top here, where the account was tracking along quite nicely. And then all of a sudden at a certain point, it triggered a spike and it went up. With each level of detection, that will either go up or go down. There is a natural aging process to detections, depending on which detection depends on the aging process for that particular detection. And accounts will go up and down in a threat and certainty score. Um, one of the things I like to call out here is um, mention a, a thing that we call kingpin. So Vectra attributes all of our detections to actionable users that are ident user identities, such as I am, SAML, something like that, or external accounts, actually even AWS services. There is a complex problem with this because users in AWS are encouraged to assume other roles to perform actions and actively discouraged to perform actions as the accounts they have logged in with. In some cases, users will even assume roles after assuming a role, confusing I know, in order to be able to perform certain actions. Um, a dedicated team of data scientists use advanced machine learning techniques to attribute any activity uh, up to the original actor based on login activity across your AWS account. So when you see any AWS detection in our product, you'll also see a chain of roles that has been assumed by this actor um, before performing that particular action. And I'll show this later on in one of the detections. So you can see here, we have a list of three separate detections that are there. Uh, and one of the things you might notice is there's the investigate this detection one hour before or after. I won't go through a lot of this other stuff. There's SAML account. Um, here's the kill chain that it's actually sitting in there from an, uh, an attack phase. Um, but what I wanted to go into was to investigate uh, this account one hour before or after the detection. So when we click on that, there you go, it actually shows up the thing. I'll move to the next slide. So this is us looking, clicking on that and going into a particular detection and showing it a bit deeper, right? So here you can see the changes that have actually been made to the services, regions, roles, what sign-ins and other activities. As you can see at the top here, we have the opportunity to adjust the timeline if required. We can go forward and backward and expand it. Um, typically it runs back 72 hours, I think. Um, but essentially there's a sliding window to be able to see all of the activities for a particular account over a period of time. You can see changes that have been made to services. There's some region comments, some various other things that are in there as well. Uh, up the top is the timeline. Perfect. So what indicates unauthorized activity within your AWS environment? And here, I'm going to be a little bit flexible with that conversation. Okay. As I mentioned before, you can have two sides of a particular detection. One is that there is a malicious intent. The other one is that there is some sort of benign or understood uh, activity that is going on. So I'm going to look at three specific detections that from the list that I showed you previously. Um, suspicious credential usage, AWS user permission enumeration, and AWS suspect public S3 change. Uh, I think the last one's probably going to be fairly self-explanatory. The other two need a little bit of um, hand-holding to kind of understand where they're coming from. So first one, AWS suspicious credential usage. So this detection triggers when an EC2 generated 
temporary credential uh, is used outside of the EC2 that actually generated it. So possibly because an attacker has actually extracted that particular credential and is then using it to further their attack. Or alternatively, it could be an application that's using the credential in a weird way, all right? So actions, obviously, review the activities performed by the account and disable the account if, if required. Okay, cool. So let's have a look at what we can see here. So firstly, we have a timeline at the top as to when the action was that occurred. And here you can see um, the actual process and it goes, obviously you can flip it, but it goes from, uh, from the bottom here, moving its way up the actual chain, right? So we have uh, described the format, described the schedule instance, described the region, described this, move there, and we've gone up. But what's interesting about it is you can see the source IP. That is not the EC2 internal source IP address. Right? That's an external that has been, that's reaching out and utilizing the credentials against the AWS environment itself. You can see here, there's your definition. There's some details as to why there's the AWS service and the rest of the stuff that's associated with it. Uh, the next one is AWS user permission enumeration. So when attacking AWS, um, you may compromise credentials for an IAM user or a role, right? And this is kind of a standard process to gain access to other resources. However, it kind of prevents a problem for attackers as they don't know what permissions they actually have access to. So to find this out, attackers will try as many API safe API calls as possible, seeing which ones fail and which ones succeed. Um, all this is not kind of normal activity that this particular EC2 should probably deal with, right? Um, so as a result of this, a detection will trigger. Um, Vectra's idea is to always find the outliers, is to always find what is different from normal, right? So the EC2 may be sitting there just serving up a web page or providing some sort of a service or whatever we're actually talking about. And all of a sudden it starts enumerating to figure out, okay, well, what's going on? So based on this activity, an attacker may be actively looking for privilege escalation. Now, to be fair, an alternative option would be that an IT admin is trying to figure out if I'm in this position as this particular resource, EC2, whatever I'm talking about, what are my rights? You know, maybe I'm testing it. Um, the other thing is it could even be a security tool that act actively wants to see what is the visibility that I can actually get. So here we actually have a straight up enumeration. Again, timeline, details, AWS account, what's actually occurred. And this is a data that's live pulled from the actual uh, AWS instances. <clears throat> from there, we can do some assessment and we can make a decision as to whether or not this is something that we care about now or something that needs to be escalated or it's a benign detection that we can possibly miss for this particular session. Finally, probably the biggest one that you see from an AWS, at least publicly in the news, um, is a suspect public uh, S3 change. And it can be S3 or it could be all sorts of other different buckets as well. So credential was observed suspiciously invoking a set of S3 APIs that permits public access to a given bucket. Possible root causes, hackers scanning for maliciously modifying configurations around the S3 bucket to enable data exfiltration, right? But it could just as easily be an IT misconfiguration. It's made by an authorized user, which is weakening the posture around the S3 buckets and promoting the risk of data loss. So it doesn't need to be an active attack. It could just be something that's being changed within the environment 
they're not necessarily understanding what the impact is going to be of those changes and the data that's being left out there. I mean, we read articles on a regular basis as to, you know, an S3 bucket is discovered open and all this data was downloaded and we don't necessarily know for how long that has occurred. Or same scenario, an internal tool is scanning the buckets for security reasons. And I put that one into the last two detections because it is, it's something that I do see um, and it is something that sometimes you have to account for. So um, we have escalated to customers before, they've run around in circles only to discover that there is a sort of standard security tool that does this on a regular basis, but until they put Vector in the environment, they were not even aware themselves. Um, and in fact, there was one I dealt with where it opened the bucket up, did the testing, closed the bucket up afterwards. So it kind of cleaned up for itself. Same as before, um, here we have the detection. Oh, I mentioned the question mark earlier. There's the question mark. If you click on that, it'll actually show you details of it. We have our timeline as to when it occurred. We have details. Um, and here we have all of the different policies and what we've actually done to those particular policies and what changes they are. Now, no, changes can be both directions. Um, changes could be we've opened it up for public usage or just as easily we've closed it from public to private because you're making changes within that space. Um, and that sometimes is important uh, if you have a public S3 bucket for an application or something like that. And then as part of a change, it actually pushes it back. So it's a very useful piece there. Okay. So how to respond at speed to detections in your AWS environment. Now, this was a little bit difficult for me to, to come up with some, some answers as to what I was going to do in that particular space. So what I did instead was I looked at a live example of what it would look like um, if something attacked your environment and what the detections would kind of look like. Now, obviously I can't take it from a customer's environment, put it up on a webinar, um, but I've taken data, which is why the dates are out a little bit, from a test case that we had that we ran through a lab to actually get the data set for. So, time is always of the essence of a security incident. And one of the most commonly taught tactics for AWS exploitation is the use of server-side request forgery uh, to access the EC2 metadata service, right? From there, the activities, the attacker's activities will escalate very rapidly. So you can see here we've got, they've used a server-side request forgery um, to get a session, um, an EC2 instance metadata profile, the role is only permitted to assume role. And I'm not gonna to go too deep into these if you want to Google these later on, you'll, you'll kind of understand where the process lies from that perspective. Um, the attacker creates a new role with no permissions and then replaces the instance profile with this new role. Attacker then edits the original role and then adds the new role to the trusted policy. Through brute force, the attacker assumes an IAM role with S3 administrative permissions. The attacker then enumerates S3 and downloads the object. So this was a, a live testing of an environment. Now, when you look at it from a detection perspective, and remember, I forgot to, you can actually click on the first scene, so I would put it around the opposite direction. But the detections are going from the, essentially from the bottom up, which you can see fairly easily with the timestamps that are there, right? So on the account page, we can see the activity on the timeline, as well as working the detections from ground up. So firstly, an unusual credential is used. You can see that down the bottom. Then the organizational discovery shows the enumeration. The user permissions are then enumerated. The suspicious E2 enumeration shows the lateral movement. Um, the S3 enumeration would be a listing prior to actual download. Um, and you will note we don't have all of the detections for the S3 download because it didn't trigger. 
but all that activity is tracked back to the original account utilizing Kingpin, right? Um, if I go to the next one, here you can actually see the account and then all of the IAM roles that have actually been assumed as the process goes through, the amount of times that they were assumed, the dates, and if you expand them here, I just ran out of space for the presentation. Um, these ones will grow, will go through the actual uh, detections by time, date, and, and all the rest of the stuff that's there. Um, now, as a comparison, um, we had guard duty sitting there. So guard duty captured all of the server side requests forgery, which is what you kind of expect. Um, there's no mention of the S3 activity or the IAM roles that are actually in the chain. And to be fair, that that is kind of guard duty is a logging situation. Right. If we went through and we found the individual logs and the attempts, that's what would actually have shown up. Right. Vectra just takes that data and push it, brings it together using the modeling and the Kingpin technology to be able to get all of that together so that you can see it in one space. Uh, further down, this is what it actually picked up without any of the chain. Um, with any of the roles changing, chaining. Okay. Final thoughts. And apologies, this was rather quick, um, but it's it's not a complex topic uh, for me. Uh, I include a single meme for this particular one. Um, I'm old school. I come from the days of Bash and Unix, and it, it really is no cloud. It's just other forms of computers and other ways of interacting with stuff. Um, you just need to have a better way to understand what is going on in the environment and how everything kicks together. Um, so I hope I've demonstrated to you how you can efficiently locate these concerns in your AWS environment. And I will try and find some Q and A questions uh, to make up a bit more time at the end of this. I have a couple. Marvelous. Okay. So why can I not see the Q and A stuff? My apologies. Okay, cool. So first one, how does your pro prioritize critical and high risk hosts that require immediate attention from an analyst? Okay. So, I skipped over this a little bit at the beginning. Uh, let me just try and bring up um, one of the slides that I wanted to bring up here. Uh, it would have been easier to jump to these, but for the moment, that's okay. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So when you get a detection, single detection for... Uh, an account or a role or whatever we're actually talking about at this point. Um, a single detection will usually push, depending on the detection, if it's informational, it doesn't score, um, will push you into sort of the low quadrant here. Um, one of the things that I try to teach our analysts as we go through is there, there really isn't, there are very few single detections um, that scare me on their own. It is the combination of a number of detections together that are probably more dangerous than anything else. Um, if I go back to the list of the detections, which I just went past, um, you can kind of see here, <coughs> Tor activity probably would be something I would be concerned about immediately. Um, ransomware is a rapid read write uh, to S3 buckets. Um, there are some uh, legitimate reasons why a detection like this would trigger. Um, but not many. I have seen a couple of them that needs to be dealt with. Uh, one of the ones that I like, where is it? It's outbound. Uh, suspect credentials, S3 organizational 
discovery it's out yeah there we go external network discovery so essentially what's happening is there's an ec2 instance or some sort of an instance which is actually actively port scanning out to the internet somewhere now first things first it's probably going to make aws question something about your account if you haven't got if you're not authorized to do that if somebody comes back and complains to amazon they're going to know who is utilizing that IP address. So that's probably going to be a bad situation, but it's also a bad thing for your environment to be doing as well, right? Um, it, it, it is definitely something that's kind of questionable to figure it out. So I would expect if there is uh, an EC2 instance or, or an instance that is actually being compromised, that there is not a single detection. So single detection will push it to a certain level multiple detections will pull it up. It's not a linear mathematical equation. Um, the data scientists have done a lot of work to kind of model how um, A plus B doesn't necessarily equal C, but it's slight derivative of it. And to be honest, it's a little bit beyond me, but I'm, I'm yet to come up with any complaints as to how they actually do it. So I need to scroll down to see the questions. Uh, can you please, sorry. Oh, you mentioned that some detections can be legitimate activity. Okay. Yes. So, um, one of the things is you are going to get some false positive detections. Um, it, it is kind of one of the simple things that comes out, right? Every product is going to trigger it. Um, if you have a look here in one of the detections, uh, when I've got one, come on, I had one later on, sorry, bingo. Uh, there's an opportunity here called triage. Um, this is probably about, it's a large chunk of what I do for customers. Um, what I do for customers is uh, I work with them to find what is their day-to-day -day benign activities. Uh, and then based out of that, I create a custom model. And it can be anything from, you know, here's, a uh, here's an account that should be making a particular detection to another machine. How does that work? Um, can we make that detection removed so that my analysts don't have to work with it? Yes, 100%. That's kind of how it's supposed to be done. Uh, how does this product differ from guard duty? Okay. All right. This one's going to be a little bit longer. So I will take a little bit of time on this because I knew that this question was going to come out. So, um, First things first, Amazon is a partner to Vectra. We are not in competition, right? Um, what we provide over the top is um, an overarching coverage of a whole plethora of the detections. But I'll go through a couple of the points that I made sure um, that I could cover off just to make sure, right? So Guard Duty only detects activities within each AWS account, right? It doesn't even correlate across these accounts. It just has a detection for each one of them. If you want to search, you have to go into the guard duty for that particular account, this particular account, that particular account. So Vectra spans across the entire IT footprint itself, right? Um, AWS guard duty alerts are individual events that are kind of ordered chronologically and categorized by severity and prioritized by recency, right? We don't do that part of it. What we do is we actually score each detection by severity and certainty, and then detections are anchored to specific hosts, uh, and the hosts get assigned to their own sort of severity and certainty scores, right? So hosts with high threat provide manageable low noise over on the left here. Um, guard duty findings are generated from a combination of managed rule sets and threat intel, right? So you're getting detections based off activities or threat intel that is expected, right? Vetra leverages a number of AI models um, that are resilient to both minor and major changes in the attacker's approach, right? Um, one of the things that we kind of pride ourselves on is that as things change, the models themselves adapt and they kind of understand how this is supposed, you know, how 
it has escalated or how it's actually changed from that particular scenario. Uh, what else have I got? Uh, Judy. Uh, what else have I got here, Claire? Can you please describe more detailed steps of the attack scenario? Right. No, it's it's a little bit... It would take a little bit too much time to kind of go through the whole process. Um, but what I'll do is I'll try and do it at a high level for you. So to be able to get access um, to an EC2 instance metadata, <coughs> it's one of the standard um, it's one of the standard ways that you you see to get access um, to underlying infrastructure, right? Straight up Googling SSRF, AWS, EC2, and metadata will give you the breakdown of that. Essentially, once you can get access to the underlying framework, I suppose you call it, of the EC2, um, at that point, you have certain rights to be able to do things. And what they've done is they've taken that particular um, metadata that's there, made some changes, expanded out the security roles so that it can actually do more, push some data, done some brute force, and then gone a lot further into the data to pull, pull it all down. Um, what I might do is there is a public example of this. I'm just going to make a note. And when this gets posted, I might try and um, attach that note uh, as to how it actually works. Uh, it's about all that I have right here at the moment. Um, I can go a little bit deeper into detections, but at this point, that's pretty much um, all that I've got that I can pass on as usefulness at the moment. Um, I appreciate, sorry, pushing the things the wrong way. Um, I appreciate the time that you guys have taken uh, to actually attend this. Um, for me, it is uh, very early in the morning, so I'm continuing to enjoy the coffee to keep me through the thing. Um, but thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. And I hope to see you at the next one that I have to perform at. <laughs>